Welcome to Weekend Bible Study. I'm Elder Philip Smith, your teacher, and I'm just so happy you could join us again and be with us as we delve off into God's Word. As I say on every week, the more the Word of God you know, the easier it is to live this life. We want to just thank our pastor, the Apostle Herman L. Murray, Jr., and our First Lady Evangelist Danielle Murray, and our founding First Mother, Evangelist Shirley Murray, for giving us this opportunity to come before you. You know, we just want to thank God, first off and foremost, for each and every one of you that have been tuning in and those things that you've been writing. I have really been encouraged by your words. I thank you for that. And, and I want to say this, um, before we even pray, let me say this. This that we're doing is a team effort. You know, there's always just one person in front of the camera, but there's always somebody behind the camera, someone who's doing the reading. Y'all can hear the readers and everything. So I want to thank them while we're here before all of you to let you know that they're here. And I want to thank them for helping us to do this. Now, go with me before the throne of God. Grace and kind Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you again for giving us this glorious opportunity to go into thy word. We're asking that you open up our understanding that we might be able to receive that which you have for us on this morning. We ask you to carry your blessings on to the morning services, save, deliver, and set free as only you can. And as you use these and other blessings, be so careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray that everyone say amen. Amen. All right. Part two of the story of Gideon. You know, last week Gideon got his call. And we went through all of the things that happened with Gideon. God had chosen him to deliver Israel from the hands of the Midianites. But he neglected to give Gideon all the facts because there was a lot that he had to, uh, 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 first off, prove himself to Gideon. That's thing number one. Thing number two, he had to give him the way he wanted it done. As I said on last week, call just means come here. Call means come closer so I can instruct you because you have to uh, be instructed before you can be sent out to do the work of God. And, and as I said, many of us kind of get this thing mixed up. I said it on last week. We feel like the call means to go out and preach. Many times uh, we've heard of celebrities who have uh, been saved and God has called them in and immediately they think it's time to preach. No, it may be time to testify, but it's not time to preach. You've got to have something to preach. And I'm not just uh, saying that myself, that's with anybody. Just because God has, uh, has been gracious enough to call you to him doesn't mean it's time for you to go out with the message. you got to get a message first. You don't show up at college and walk out with your degree the next day. So why do we think that we can come to God one day and then the next day we're going to set the world on fire? It doesn't work that way. So the call of Gideon was last week, but this week we see the actions of Gideon. The Bible gives us to know that, well, the Sunday school lesson is what I'm talking about. Gideon defeats the Midianites is our lesson for today. So now we're seeing the actions of Gideon. Now, as I said, we're going uh, to review just a little bit of last week's lesson. I'm going to try not to be too lengthy in that, but as I've always told you, I want you to get an understanding. And in order to get an understanding, we have to set the scene. We have to make sure you understand what was going on. And, and, and I said on last week, and I'm going to repeat this again, our God is logical. He doesn't do things by chance or happenstance. He doesn't work on whim. He has a plan in place. Bear that in mind. I said he had a plan, has a plan in place. Like I told you, this unit is kings and leaders. And as we study it, bear in mind that God was preparing a people to be his ambassador. He has a plan in place. So as we go through the scriptures, we're going to see how God worked the plan out then. And why is that important now? Because the same way he worked back then is the same way he works now. Hebrews 13 and 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I think it's Malachi 3 and 6, I am the Lord thy God, and I changes not. He does things the same way. 
He just may, we may have different times, we may have different people, maybe different opinions, but our God is forever the same. Now, as I before stated, he chose Gideon to deliver Midian from the hands of the, to deliver, excuse me, Israel from the hands of the Midianites. But he didn't give him all the facts. And there's a good reason for that, because if God were to tell you everything that he has planned for your life from the very beginning, some of us would not go. Some of us would run from there. Because I'm going to tell you the thing about having faith in God. Faith in God can get you in trouble. You know why I can get you in trouble? Because the devil can't stand you already. And when you start exhibiting faith in God, then that means that you're becoming more empowered to destroy his kingdom. Mm -hmm. So he's coming. Amen. So it can get you into trouble. But the wonderful thing about faith, if you hold on to it, it'll bring you out of the trouble. Mm -hmm. Think of faith as a shield, as the Bible calls it, the shield of faith. And most of us think about the shield on your arm, but think about the shield covering your entire body, mm. protecting you from the fiery darts of the enemy, keeping you protected while you travel through this way that God has planned for you. So he didn't give him everything. You know, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Trust me, God will direct you, but you got to stay long enough as I spoke before stated. You don't come into the church one day and go out setting the world on fire the next. You got to stay long enough to get instruction. In the 19th chapter of the book of Acts, Paul ran across a group of believers who were acting like believers. They were carrying themselves out as believers, but Paul noticed there was something missing from them. And if we go there, you'll find he said, well, you got it? Go ahead, read it. <clears throat> Acts 19, verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. Uh -huh. Verse 2, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? Read. And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy he found certain disciples acting a certain way, so he knew they were disciples. He could recognize that they were disciples, but he said something, something's not quite right. And so he asked the question, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Have you been empowered by God since you believe? And the answer was, we haven't even heard of the Holy Ghost. Well, you say, well, Brother Philip, aren't we talking about Gideon? Stay with me. They hadn't even heard of the Holy Ghost. What did he say? All right. Go on, verse 3. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? Mm -hmm. And they said, Unto John's baptism. Thank you, that's enough. They were baptized unto John's baptism. I remember the great one used to always tell us when he would read from the scripture, he's trying to figure out how they missed it because John preached about the Holy Ghost. Mm. John told us, One coming after me whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with Holy Ghost and with fire. So it was preached by John, but some kind of way they missed it. But why would you bring that in, Brother Philip? Like I told you about Gideon. He couldn't give him all the information at first for him. But with some people, God can't give you all the information because you either come to church late or you leave early. How are you expecting to get everything from God if you don't stay long enough to hear the message? You leave it off, and oh, Lord, don't go there, Brother Philip. Okay, I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. I love y'all, though. God bless you. I'm just trying to help you. So Gideon assumed he would need an army. Now, once God had gotten his attention through the miracles he did, we know, uh, the angel burning up the food and, of course, Gideon going down, tearing down the Asherah tree and the, and, and the Baal, uh, the Baal worship place. He got all of that destroyed, got him a new name in the process. Jerubabal. In other words, let Baal contend with him. That's what it means, basically. So he got a new name in the process. You know, sometimes when God is dealing with people uh, and they do certain acts, the names are changed. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Abram's name was changed to Abraham because he did exactly what God wanted him to do. Now, God didn't change Gideon's name, but uh, the people did. You know, some of us pick up nicknames in high school. I'm not going to give you my nickname, so forget that. I know some of you are wondering, don't worry about it. It, it, it's dead in the water, and that's a clue. Anyway, <laughs> and that's a clue. Anyway, 
once God had gotten Gideon's attention and he, Gideon had done the things God asked him, Gideon assumed he would need an army, okay, to conquer the Midianites and their allies. So he blew the trumpet and called his family and sent messengers to Manasseh, Asher, Zebulon, and Naphtali. When they had all assembled, he had a force of 32,000 men. Now he blew the, what we call the clarion call. The clarion call of the trumpet is to assemble. That brought the people in. Now, first he blew the trumpet amongst his family, the Abiezrites. He blew the trumpet and called all his relatives in. He said, well, well Philip, you, you, know, you know what? <clears throat> Just like charity begins at home, you know, faith should begin at home too. The family, look, if you, want, if you want to go out and win the world, make sure you win your house first, okay? okay. You know, I wrote a song years ago. Uh, a good friend of mine asked me to write him a song, and the song was Don't Forget to Save the Folks at Home. Mm. Too many people, too many preachers, I mean, we go out trying to win the world, but then our kids are going astray at the house. Mm. If anybody ought to be our main concern, it should be our family. So Gideon blew the trumpet for his family to gather first. Then... He sent messages to the other tribes to come and join them, those tribes that were in that area. Like I told you, every area wasn't hit at the same time with every occupation or every oppression. Mm -hmm. So under this oppression, these four tribes were affected and Ephraim as well. Mm -hmm. So he blew the trumpet, and after he blew the trumpet, and after he sent the messages, he got a whopping 32,000 men. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. He had a force ready to do something. Only problem was the force they were going against had 130,000 men. So that's kind of like every man in Gideon's army had four men to kill, and some of them had five. You know, math is a wonderful thing. <laughs> math gives you understanding. So the math said, you got four, you got four, I'm going to give you five, and that's how we're going to take down the Midianites. Now, Gathering all these shoulders was necessary. Now, it made Gideon feel more empowered, I'm sure. Even though he was going up against a great force, he had heard about the miracles of God because he had said that to the angel when he first heard it, right? Mm -hmm. He heard about the miracles. So what did he do? I've got 32,000 men behind me. All I need is a little bit of a miracle, and we can win it. Now, being able to gather so many soldiers that quickly and easily should have bolstered Gideon's confidence, right? Mm -hmm. Not so. Gideon, as he said, you know what? Give me uh, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 1 and 26 again. Yes, sir. Give me that again. Sorry. <clears throat> I'm trying to get to the lesson, y'all. Well, I'm in the lesson, but you know what I mean. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Mm -hmm. For ye see your calling, brethren, uh -huh. how there are not many wise men after the flesh, uh -huh. not many mighty, uh -huh. Not many noble. Yes. Are called. He doesn't call all the folks that's up here. Read. But God had chosen the foolish things of the world. He's chosen the foolish things. To confound the wise. Now, this is a foolish thing. Think about it. God, Gideon told God, he said, my family is the least in Manasseh. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Then he goes on to say, I'm the least in my family's house. I mean, you're talking about the dregs of the earth, as they say. You couldn't get any lower than Gideon. But that's who God chose. Because God chooses the foolish things. See, to the outside, like I said, I'm sure, uh, on last week, I'm sure there were mightier men in Manasseh than Gideon. I'm sure there were more accomplished soldiers than Gideon. But God chose Gideon to prove Two things. Number one, that he doesn't need the best to bring about the best outcome. And number two, many times the best person for the job is not who everybody thinks it should be. Think about that. Consider yourself. You wonder, well, why would God save the old me? Because there's something special inside of you. And he wants to use that to bring about great change in the world. So he called himself the smallest thing. Now, that's why Gideon still had issues, even though he had gotten all these men to come in so quickly. Mm -hmm. 
but he still felt a little better than he otherwise would have. But because of this, he asked God for a second and a third sign. This is where the fleece comes in. I talked to y'all about that last week. You know, how I identified it with it myself in my own ministry. So God did exactly what he asked him to do with the fleece. So now Gideon has gotten three miracles from God. So it has shored him up completely. And you know, sometimes it takes us a while to get it. As I said on last week, some of us, it takes us a while to build up enough confidence. And it's really not the confidence in God, it's the confidence in ourselves and our own relationship with God. That's what gets in trouble with us. Some of us, we, we, we would do greater things than what we do, but we're not sure that we are up to the challenge. And, and many times we would rather stay in the background. You know why? Because we don't want the responsibility. And I get it. Trust me. I'm not someone who wants the responsibility either. But if you said, for God I live and for God I die, if you said, Lord, use me, then you don't get to pick and choose how he does it. Mm. All right. Now that he had these things, he got his two signs, he's ready. Now he felt that he had all he needed to, to defeat the Midianites and deliver Israel. Unfortunately, as with many of us, Gideon's methods did not coincide with God's plan. He had gathered 32,000 men, one-fourth of the enemy's force. He felt like once he got the, two the next two miracles, he felt like he was ready for this. But just because we feel like we're ready, just because we feel like we're qualified, does not mean that's truth. Everybody, like I said, you may have ability, and that's a wonderful thing. But there may be some other things lacking that are needed for this particular job. Everybody can't do everything. Look, I, I, I'm, I'm, when I say this, I am not minimizing myself. Don't get me wrong. I'm not minimizing me. But I do believe there are other people that could probably teach this lesson better than I can. I believe that. I'm not saying that. I'm not able to do this, but I do believe there are others who probably are even more qualified than me in certain ways, in certain ways. But for this time, God has got me here, so what do I do? I just do what God gives me to do until he gives me something else to do. And I love what I do because I love working for the Lord. So trust me, I'm not trying to get out of the job. That's not what I mean. But I'm just saying that we have to be prepared for everything that God has for us to do, okay? And if God has given us to do it, then he's prepared us for it. When the Lord calls, he qualifies, okay? So understand that. Don't, don't minimize yourself, as I said, but then don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to, Romans 12, 3. Read it for yourselves. Now, like I said, our plans don't always coincide with what God's plans are, God's methods. I have a friend of mine that I used to work with. We call him Rob Knob. The reason we call him Rob Knob because that was his clown name. He was a professional clown on the side. And Rob used to always say, if you want to know how to make God laugh, just tell him your plans. <laughs> tell him your plans. Because, see, your plans <laughs> are never his plans. In fact, if you have plans right now, throw them out the window and go to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 again. <laughs> Rewind that. Throw your plans out the window, and in all thy ways acknowledge him so he can direct your path. Because you know what's the problem with our, between, the difference between our plan and God's plan? His works. We don't have a guarantee. Okay. So his plan didn't coincide with God's plan. He got all these people. God looked upon the force that Gideon was, had been able to gather and recognized a fatal flaw. There was a flaw with the force that he had gathered. Now, some people might say, well, well Philip, he was already uh, 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 at a disadvantage, how could there be a flaw? He had 32,000 men going up again. Now, maybe that's the flaw you're talking about. No, that wasn't the flaw. The flaw was impending pride. See, you've got to understand Israel's history. Look, they were not able to enter the promised land 
because of unbelief. Because of, in essence, because of pride. You may say, well, how can unbelief and pride be the same thing? Simple. If you believe in God, then you don't believe in yourself. Your pride in yourself goes out the window when you put all your trust in God. But if you don't trust God, that means you have more pride in yourself. You have more belief in yourself than you do in God. You have doubts with God, so you're going to act in your own way. They had established a pattern. Another thing, too. If he had given them the victory, even though they were outnumbered four to one, had he given them the victory, they would have thought that they themselves had brought about this victory with their own hands. So God said, now get in, you got too many folks. Look, as I said, with Proverbs 16 and 18, pride coming before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. Pride keeps us from actually uh, 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 getting the victory because our pride makes us do things that we wouldn't otherwise do if we have faith. You know, when they say the, the wrath of man working out the night righteousness of God, that's because pride is in the way. <laughs> It cannot do God's righteousness because of pride. So that has to go. So God looked upon them and said, Gideon, you got too many folks. So first thing I want you to do is tell the people that are afraid to go home. We got to get rid of some of these folks. When Gideon told them to go home, 22,000 men went home. Now, let me say this. Before the battle with the second enemy could be engaged, the first enemy had to be vanquished. The second enemy was the Midianites. The first enemy was pride and unbelief. So God had to vanquish those two enemies first. That's why he told Gideon to tell everybody who was afraid to go home. And he lost 22,000 men in that first wave. And, and let me tell you something about that, too. In order for God's plan to work, he had to have people that completely trusted Gideon. Do you hear me? Because he was not dealing with everybody individually. That's why you can't, you, let me say this, let me say this for those of you out there. You cannot be a member of a church if you don't trust your leader. You have to have complete confidence in your leader. Because if you don't have complete confidence in your leader, then you are going to be a problem at some point. Because you can't help yourself because your pride is going to get in the way. You're going to get to thinking that you know more than somebody else. So if you can't trust the person that you're sitting under, move. If you don't have that confidence in God's man or woman, whoever he put over you, then you need to move on to someplace else. I'm serious. If he had taken fearful men into battle, once the battle was enjoined and their fear rose up, guess what? They would get in the way of the fighting, trying to get away, and it would cause utter chaos. And in the midst of chaos, Israel would have been destroyed. So God got rid of the fearful first. And then he had 10,000 men that were left over. So... Now he's gone down from 4 to 1 to 13 to 1. <laughs> the odds still don't look very good. But I have here, you have to ask the question, why? When people want to help you and you don't really know why they want to help you, you need to ask why. Why did those 10,000 men stay? What were their motives? Were their motives because they trusted Gideon? Or did they want to get back at the Midianites? Did they want to make a name for themselves? Did they have suicidal tendencies and they just wanted to die in the battle? You know, uh, some of this sounds, you know, sounds funny or crazy, but trust me, people have different motives for doing things. 
And God tries the hearts of men. He knows what's going on on the inside. So he knew pride was still a problem within Gideon's ranks. He may have gotten rid of the scary proud folk, but he still had the other proud folk there. And God knew that in order to bring about the deliverance, and remember I said, God is logical. Please keep that in mind as we go forward and we start reading the lesson. God is logical. Everything he did is going to be logical. He told Gideon to take them down to the water, and I'm going to try them there. You did, you did what you were supposed to do to send folk home. That worked only partially well. I will get rid of the rest of them. He takes them down to the water, and they bend over. He says, everyone that laps water like a dog, him you take. Now, what was he doing here? Like I said, different people had different reasons for staying. And if their motives were not pure, then God wanted to get rid of them. You say, well, Brother Philip, what's the difference between somebody, well, how could they lap water like a dog? What God was trying, to get the, was trying to get Gideon to see and trying to get them to see was people who were attentive. See, when you lap water like a dog, you know, a lot of times when they got down to drink water, they would just bend over and put their whole face in the water. Well, once you put your whole face in the water, you can't see what's going on around you. You don't know. The enemy could be coming up behind you with a rock ready to bust you upside your head or a spear or a knife or a sword or whatever. But when they lap water like a dog, they would scoop the water up in their hands and bring it to their mouth. That way, their eyes are not encumbered. Their attention is at the ready. So when this was done, he only had 300 men. God said, that's enough. <laughs> And he took them off. And this is where our lesson begins. Judges 7 and 9. And it came to pass that night that the Lord said unto him, Arise and get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. Now, I'm sure Gideon's thinking, Well, Lord, you took me down to one, hold up, less than 1% of the men I started with. And you're telling me to get up now and go face 130,000 men who look like locusts lying down on the ground and camels that look like the sand of the sea. So really, you got a bunch of fast locusts out there. But you want me to take 300 men and go down and defeat them. So I'm sure there's doubts in getting Even though he's seen the miracles of God. Now, and let me say this too. The miracles were on a small stage, all right? So, uh, you know, I'm not saying that Gideon actually doubted him a lot, but it wasn't like God rained down hell <laughs> like he did in Egypt or parted the Red Sea. You know, it wasn't like he brought up a swarm of flies and stuff like that. No, these were just small miracles. But then someone would say there are no small miracles. A miracle is something that happens contrary to nature. And if God can make a flea, lift a brick. Mm -hmm. Come on now. Mm -hmm. He can burn down a whole forest in an instant. <laughs> He's not limited. But he tells Gideon to get up and go down to the camp because I've delivered him into thine hand. And I'm sure Gideon went, but he still had some reservations. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Furah, thy servant, down to the host. So if you're afraid to go by yourself, Take your servant, Fura. Sound like hoorah, don't it? Hmm. That's it does. Sound like hoorah, we're going to make it. Hoorah, we're going to defeat the enemy. But there was another reason he told him to take Fura with him. Well, for, let me read this first scripture. And thou shalt hear what, thy, what they say, and afterward shall thine hand be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then he went down with Fura, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. Give me that scripture, son. Matthew 18 and 16. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, mm -hmm. that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, uh -huh. every word may be established. What scripture is that? Matthew 18 and 16. All right. Did you hear that? Out of the mouth of two and three witnesses, that every word may be established. See, because when Gideon got back to his men, whether or not he told them about the dream or not, if he did tell them, then he needed somebody to back him up. So God told him, take somebody with you. 
because let's face it, y'all, people, we go out and we tell people about the goodness of God and how good as God has been to us. And sometimes it will have an effect and sometimes it will not. But when we have other people with us that do the same thing and amen to what we're saying, it usually has a, a stronger effect, a stronger impact on those that are listening. Witnesses make the difference. If you have somebody who can attest to what you've seen and can tell them exactly how God has blessed them, it makes a difference. So he took Fura down there with him. Verse 12. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along the valley like grasshoppers, like locusts, for multitude. And their camels were without number as the sand of the sea for multitude. And you can remember, imagine how Gideon felt when he came down there. I don't care if we were out with him or not. Ooh-wee! <laughs> Good God Almighty. And I'm sure, Lord, uh, as I said, you know, you know what? I'm going to tell you something about the way we look at the scriptures. We over-spiritualize it. We do. We make it more spiritual or more supernatural than it really is. Well, Brother Philip, Jesus said, my word is spirit, my word is life. It is. But we're talking about a natural situation that happened. It actually happened. You can put yourself in that situation and see how you would have reacted. Do you really think you went down there? Oh, ain't no problem. No. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that I would have done that. I would have been like, get him and like, you know, buck out, eyes, bigger quarters, and say, okay, Lord, uh, I'm going to get this. You're going to deliver this into my hand. I might have been stumbling over my words, too, <laughs> back then, too. But he looked and saw all those men and all those camels, and I'm sure he was wondering, okay, Lord, how is this supposed to work? And when Gideon was come, and behold, there was a man, this verse 13, that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dream a dream. And lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came unto a tent and smote it, and it fell and overturned, and, to, and overturned it that the tent lay alone. Now, as I was reading in the exposition, you know what, can I ask y'all something? Why do we, as I told you, we over-spiritualize things sometimes in the scriptures, and sometimes we over-grandiorize it, if that's a word. You know, I don't know why we picture this great big barley cake rolling down. He didn't say a big barley cake. I was reading an exposition. They're talking about a great, a big barley cake. It doesn't say anywhere in this scripture about, you know what a barley cake was? It's about the size of a biscuit. Mm. And barley was the lowest grain, the poorest grain. It was used to feed the animals, y'all. And the poor people used it to grind it for bread. And it was hard bread. We're not, we're not talking about, we're not talking about the fluffy white wonder bread or whatever. This was hard bread. You know, those people that have been in the Army, they know about tack biscuits that back in World War II, them things so hard they take a teeth out, tooth out, if I'm not mistaken. I heard about that. But, yeah, so these, these weren't, these weren't no, no little fluffy white, you know, whatever biscuit, Pillsbury. <laughs> We're talking about barley. And what about, you know, it's about that big. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't great big. Even if it had been big, it would have been no more than that. Now, I, I, now, I imagine if it's a hard biscuit, I could take a hard biscuit and throw it in a tent, and I might be able to, you know, maybe move it a little bit, move it, make it flap a little bit, and that's what me throwing it. The scripture said it rolled down into the camp. Now, how much steam would that biscuit have to have to knock down a tent? I don't care even if it was that big. It's going to have to have a full head of steam to do that. What, you know, I'm talking about, we're talking 30, 40, 50, 60 miles an hour for a biscuit to do that much damage. So I can see why this dream troubled the soldier. Now, it didn't say that he was in the tent in the dream, but whatever was going on, it was enough to unnerve him and to disturb him. 
Okay? This, this was an unnatural scene for him. Barley bread attacking. <laughs> Israel was going to throw bread at us. Okay. So he didn't understand it, but it troubled him. It's just like when Nebuchadnezzar had his dream and Daniel had to interpret it. He couldn't even remember the dream, but it disturbed him so much he could not sleep. You know, the Lord will sometimes still in this day deal in dreams. You're going to tell me you've never had a dream that upset you so much that you woke up and could not go back to sleep. And you realize later on that God was speaking. So he told him the dream. He said, the barley bread tumbled into the host of many and came to a tent and smote it, and it fell and overturned it, and the tent lay alone. Now, you know the thing that really got me when I read this? One tent. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like it destroyed the whole camp. <laughs> One tent. This, this barley loaf destroyed. But it was enough to shake his confidence. Midian did not know what to expect. Now, understand this. The way battles normally took place, they took place in the daytime with both sides of the army across from one another. And they would meet in the field in the middle and they would battle. They didn't hardly, excuse me, they didn't hardly battle at night, okay? That, that's, that's guerrilla warfare. That was developed later on. <laughs> but they didn't hardly battle at night. Now, they did set watch because the enemy might send in spies or something like that, but they were not expecting a full-scale battle at night because uh, uh, if you're battling at night, you're at a disadvantage if you are the attacker. Why are you at a disadvantage? Well, if you got arrows, you can shoot down into the camp. That's true if you got arrows, but what if you don't have arrows? Hmm. If you've got to go in, well, now you're on the enemy's territory and you're coming in at night. So you can't see just like they can't see, except for torches out there. You follow what I'm saying? So it just really was not a practice back then in ancient times. But he saw this, and it upset him. And then his fellow said, and his fellow answered and said unto him, verse 14, this is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for into his hand has God delivered Midian and all the host. Now, the thing that got me about that is the fact that this was an enemy prophesying for the Lord. This was an enemy interpreting a dream for God so that his man could be encouraged. Don't tell me what God will not do. Like I told you, God is logical. God knows exactly what it will take to encourage us to do the things that he needs us to do. He knows what it will take to build us up and make us ready. See, it doesn't take a whole lot sometimes for us to, to get going and get motivated. I remember when, when Nathaniel was uh, approached by Philip, and he was sitting up under the tree, and he said, we have found him of whom the scriptures talked about, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, huh? Can any good thing come out of Galilee? That's what, that, that's what Nathaniel said. And when he came to Jesus, Jesus said, Truly an Israelite in whom is no God. And the thing said, from whence no stop me, Lord? He said, when I was sitting up under the tree, I saw him. <laughs> Don't ask me what was so special about that. But as soon as Nathaniel heard it, he jumped down and started worshiping and said, my Lord, my God. I don't know why. Jesus said, because I said, I saw you under the tree. <laughs> you believe? But think about it. God knows exactly what we need to make us believe. Thomas, he had to put his hand. <laughs> you, 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 you see what I'm saying? It doesn't take a whole lot to convince us. All it takes is what we need to hear. Sometimes all we need to hear is, you can do it. All we need to know is, God is going to bless you. Hear me. God is going to bless you. Take that. Now he interpreted the dream, and after the dream, verse 15, and it was so that when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, that he worshiped 
and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. Now, bear this in mind. Like I told you, when Gideon first got there, he saw what the host looked like. But God did not tell him what he saw was going to cause him to be strengthened. Mm -hmm. He said what he heard. Mm -hmm. You know what? You can't ever let what you see overshadow what you know. That's the problem. A lot of times we got eye problems, and I'm not talking about this kind of eye problem, I'm talking about this kind of eye problem. We look at the magnitude of the situation and we allow it to cause us to fear and to doubt. But what did the word say? You know what? It was kind of a cliche some, some years ago, but people were putting it on necklaces and wearing it on bracelets. They would use this acronym, WWJD. What would Jesus do? How would Jesus respond? I want you to think about that because when we finish, with, when we get toward the end of this lesson, there's something I, I want to say about that. But how would Jesus have responded? is the way we should think because he left us the example to follow in his footsteps. He's our example. The Bible says Mark the perfect man, yeah, but the perfect man should be following the example of Christ. He told his man when he got back, rise up because the Lord had delivered Midian into our hand. Now I'm sure these men were, he didn't say that they were awake, I'm sure a lot of them were sleeping, but when he got back, he said, rise up, it's time to go. It's time to attack the enemy. And he divided the 300 men into three companies and put a trumpet in every man's hand with, a pitch, with empty pictures and lamps within the pictures. Now, the lamps represented torches, okay? They were torches. The pictures, uh, how many of y'all have seen kerosene lamps? Okay, kerosene lamp has an opening at the top, okay? So that the flame can come up through it, and the oxygen can get to the flame. Call that, we'll call that a picture, okay? So these pictures covered the lamps so that the light of the lamps could not be seen by the enemy. But he gave them also a trumpet. In their hands, they're holding the lamps, and they're holding a trumpet. Now, like I told you, our God is logical. He knows just what it takes to get uh, our attention, but he also knows what it takes to unnerve the enemy. So each man took what Gideon told him to do. And he said unto them, look on me and do likewise. Verse 17. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. He didn't tell him the plan. Let me say this. Sometimes God can't tell us everything yeah. that we need. To, that, 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 that what he's going to do. Because as I before stated, if he gave us all the information at the beginning, some of us wouldn't do it. We'd be too afraid. We'd overthink it. And that's something we also do. We overthink the situation. You know, sometimes you have to just do it. Don't, don't think about it. Because when you think about it, you'll get scared and run. So what did he do? He said, do as I do. Don't worry about anything else. This is all the instructions you need. He split them into three companies of 100 men each. He said, verse 18, when I blow with a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say the sword of Gideon and the, the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. Okay? Now, remember, they had, every man had a trumpet. Y'all yeah, see the wisdom of God in this? As I told you, at the beginning, Gideon blew the clarion call to call the people to come. See, they've used trumpets throughout time in wars and in battles. Each time they blew the trumpet, it was for a different reason. Uh, in, in our services now, you have reveille. Reveille is where they assemble. Then you have taps when someone has died. And they play that at the funeral. You have uh, the one they blow for the end of the day. I can't remember it right now. But these are tunes that are played, and every soldier recognizes them. Whenever they would go into battle, you know, you see the old Western movies? 
they would blow the charge. <laughs> and I'm sure, I, I can't, da, 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 you know, you know it. Everybody knows the charge. That's the charge, charging the battle. So Gideon and his men were going to blow, but they don't have several buglers. They usually just have one. In the, in the battle, they usually, now, when Joshua went into Jericho, he had seven. Okay? He had seven. But they were getting ready, and this was a different situation. But the more trumpets, usually the more people. So now you've got 300 trumpets about to blow. You, you, see, you see the wisdom of God. It's at night, number one. Number two, we're going to find out it was in the second watch. So they're just changing the guards over. So most of the men are sleeping. And when they're changing the guards to, to put in new sentries, if you blow the trumpet at that time and you attack, it puts the whole camp in disarray, chaos, and confusion. So, and the more trumpets usually signify the larger the army. <laughs> So you think about 300 trumpets blasting. Then when you add to that, mm -hmm. the crashing of the pictures, breaking them, which makes a loud noise. Mm -hmm. You know, in the seventh chapter uh, 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 of, of Second Kings, uh, we have the four leprous men who were sitting at the gate. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. And when they went out to the camp of the Syrians, the Bible said the Lord got in their footsteps and made them sound like a great host. So this is, a, you know, so this wasn't the only time that God used this type of tactic on the enemy. They blew the trumpet, 100 trumpets at one time. They crashed 100 pictures at one time. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of that, 100, 300 lights go up. <laughs> and it's not just in one area. Amen. They have surrounded the enemy and only left them one way of escape. Yep. You see how God works this thing out? Like I say, God is logical in how he does that. Well, Brother Philip, couldn't he have just wiped out all the midnight? He could have. Just like he could snap his fingers and you could have every bill in your house paid off, mm -hmm. including your house. Mm -hmm. But I have a question. What would you learn from that? God's purposes are not always about blessing us. Right. Yeah. He's also, as I told you, he was preparing a people then, and he's preparing a people now. Amen. Understand that. So his purposes do not include your desires all the time. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, did he say, if you like yourself also in the Lord, he gives you desires of your heart? He did say that. But guess what? If you delight in yourself in the Lord, guess what your desire is? Yeah. The more of God. <laughs> All right. So, now that they've blown the trumpets and they've shouted the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, the same thing that this man had just told his fellow. Do you not think that when he went and told his fellow that that fellow didn't go tell some other people and that this was not passing? See, God knows how to work things out and work things through, through natural means to bring about supernatural ends. See, we always want God to do the supernatural and the miraculous. We want him to bring down fire from heaven. We want him to make water appear out of a rock. That's not always necessary, okay? God will take natural means to bring about a supernatural end. You may say, well, Brother Philip, if it's a natural mean, how is it supernatural? Because it would have not have happened except he got involved. It would not have happened except he got involved with it. Because you know yourself, the, 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 the situation and circumstances that had to be in place for you to come about to the end that it was there, the desired end, I mean, the, 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 uh, what it, the odds of it happening that way <laughs> are astronomical. But that's the way our God works. You know, he doesn't have to use, you know, use all these spiritual and, and, and supernatural things all the time. He just said, okay, press this button. Okay, your debt's wiped clear. <laughs> Verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp, and being in the beginning of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. Verse 20. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hand. 
and the trumpets in their right hand to blow with all, and they cried, the sword of Gideon, I mean the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Well, put yourself in the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of East, of the East place. You're sleeping, all of a sudden you hear a loud blast of 300 horns. You hear the crash of 300 pitchers. Then you hear the voices of 300 men. And they're saying, the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. Now you tell me you're not running. <laughs> tell me that you're not disconcerted. You're waking up and this is what you hear? You know, I don't, I don't mind confessing a few things about myself. I'm almost finished with this lesson. But when I was coming up, I was sitting in my room one day, and, and uh, I was in there, and I had my dog in the room with me, and I was reading, and I was back before I got saved. I was reading. I don't know what I was reading, but it sounded like I heard a voice say, Phil, and it took me about a half a second to realize I was the only one in the room. Now, my bed was over here in the corner of the room, the door was probably, oh, we'll say 15 feet away. Guess what? I cleared it in one jump. I was at the door. <laughs> I'm just telling you the truth. That's how it happened. Scared my poor dog to death because <laughs> I jumped over him. <laughs> what, what am I saying here? We react. We react when we are afraid. These men jumped up. They were scared to death. They didn't know what to think, all they knew is that the sword of Gideon and the sword of the Lord. God had planted fear in the hearts of the enemy. You know, in this book of uh, 2 Kings, the 7th chapter, Jehoshaphat was going up against three kings. And they came against him, but the Lord had sent a, a, a prophet to him, a minstrel, and the minstrel told him, Thus saith the Lord, the battle is not yours, it is mine. When they went out to fight the enemy, and God told them, don't worry about it, I got this. So Jehoshaphat put the choir in front of the army. And when they got there, they found that the enemy was all dead. The Bible said God had set ambushment on them so that they killed one another. Mm -hmm. God had confused them to the point to where they started killing one another. Each one of them looked like the enemy to them. The Midianites, when they woke up in the children of the East and the Amalekites, when they woke up in all the confusion, it was at night. They didn't know who the enemy was. So they started actually attacking themselves. And some of them were trying to hurry up and get out of there and run. As I, as I alluded to earlier in the book of 2 Kings, the 7th chapter, when they got to the camp of the Syrians, all of them were gone. They took off running because they felt like a great host was coming. In fact, they, they were running so hard, they were pulling off their, their, their armor and stuff while they were in the way to make sure that they got more, uh, got faster feet going. Mm -hmm. They lessened the weight on them. And you know what always tickled me about that particular story is they left the horses. <laughs> Now, I mean, that's urgent. That is urgently scared. Wow. The horses were still at the camp. Mm. But you see what I'm saying? This is how God works. Like I say, he's logical. Mm. He knows what to do to bring about the end. What's that, Jeremiah 29 11, 11. and 11? 29 and 11. Okay. Jeremiah 29 and 11. Uh-huh. For I know the thoughts that I think towards For I know the thoughts I think towards you. Saith the Lord. Saith God. Thoughts of peace mm -hmm. and not of evil. Mm -hmm. To give you an expected end. To give you an expected end. God has expectations. And if we trust him, his expectations become our reality. Now, I said earlier that we need to ask questions. We need to ask questions. As I told y'all, I don't, I don't, I'm here to teach the lesson not to get political. But I will say this. We need to ask questions. We need to get an understanding of what the end of a situation is going to be. You know, 
What's the sense in doing a thing if you don't know what the end game is? When we're trusting God, we trust God to bring about the end game that's going to be beneficial for us. But when people are asking us to do things, then we need to find out what's the purpose. And if we're going to become part of something and join in something, find out what is the goal. What's the end game? Don't just march without knowing why you're marching. Y'all have a great Sunday. See you next week.